Revival is not just a word. Revival is not just the latest trend. Revival is a spiritual awakening. Revival is the move of God across generations. Revival is here. What good is it to know the Word of God if you don't obey the Word of God? What good is it to know what God's Word says if you're not willing to live it out? What did Jesus say? Blessed are those who hear it and obey it. You have a redeemer, you have a rewarder, you have a restorer, you have a defender, you have a deliverer, you have a healer, you have a provider. God never leads you through pain without promise. Remember that pain from him means that he has a promise. It's because in my hands it's just a meal, but in the hands of God it becomes a miracle. In my hands it's just a lunch, but in the hands of God it becomes a legacy that transcends generations. New Anthem Church, Pastor John and Cece here, giving you a mid-sabbatical update. Actually, we needed to re-record this because there was information in the one we pre-recorded, and so it, I needed to re-record this, even though I'm not supposed to be working. So I'm about to, we're about to go back to resting. Yes. Um, wanted to give you a live update, though, because obviously what you've been watching has been pre-recorded for all of our intro videos, because... Uh, I had a jacket on, which should be your, winter a winter jacket, right? Which should be your number one clue um, because it's been 300 degrees. Yep. Yeah, the surface About. of the sun. It's been, it's been a lot. We love you guys. We miss you guys. We are resting, getting filled up. And I don't, we don't want to bore you. Yes, uh, we've been feeding each other grapes and sitting on white sandy beaches. And Cece can tell you so many stories about how I've been sweeping her off her feet. Um, I rode up on a beach on a, on a white horse and we went horseback. None of that's yeah. happened. We actually haven't seen a beach yet, which no, that's, that hasn't happened. No. Hopefully that happens, but we've been resting a lot. Uh, we've been doing conferences and all sorts of things, getting filled up for this next season. It's awesome. So thanks again so much. Um, more importantly, it's a great Sunday. If you are brand new, we want to say a special welcome to you. We hope it feels like family and like home to you. Welcome to New Anthem Church. My name is Pastor John. This is CC Pomeroy, and we've been on sabbatical. In other words, a long break to rest up and revive because we've been going hard since high school. Both of us yeah. have been going really hard full-time ministry since high school. And uh, so the board wanted us to take a break, and it's awesome. And don't let the bags under your eyes fool you. Um, that we are we are getting much rest under your eyes. under your eyes my eyes well both of our eyes yeah, probably you said your eyes. I did say okay <laughs> I, I don't this is getting out of hand listen this, this is Sunday and it's church and there's so many great things happening including such a special guest oh my gosh this is the the fourth of July weekend service yeah. this is a special outdoor weekend service. outdoor service hopefully you guys are staying cool we aren't it's literally 102 it's so in Charlotte <laughs> North Carolina yes. and it's insane and we're about to head to New York and hopefully it's cooler there I don't Probably think it's not. going to be plus we'll be slightly less safe than we are here anyways it's gonna be awesome we have a special guest here today I keep getting sidetracked yeah. um, and it, I, it's the first time that's ever happened I've never went up back home I never got sidetracked no no never. not, 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 not once. once not, not one once. time did that happen we have a special guest, uh, Pastor Elisha is in the house, going to be bringing you a word. He is a church planter launching in Canton, Michigan. I'm sure he's gonna tell you about it. Him and his wife are fire. They're incredible. They're world changers, difference makers, and they're gonna bring a word, I believe, that's gonna encourage your heart and change your life. So wherever you're at in the house, let's stand to our feet to honor the proclamation of the word of God and the speaker of the house this morning. Everybody give it up for Pastor Elisha, everybody. Yeah. All right. So quick question, show of hands, how many people have seen the movie, The Matrix? Okay, all right, good. So I don't have to explain the whole movie. I love it, I'm glad. So this is actually one of my very favorite movie series, The Matrix. Now, I love this because if you watch The Matrix and you understand The Matrix a little bit, 
you know that it has some parallels between right the Matrix and the Bible, yeah. right? I mean, the right the, the guy's name is Neo, right? I mean, the one. He's the one. He's like their Messiah. The city that they're in is Zion. I mean, come on, you got to get real here, right? And then the guy's wife's name is Trinity. Come on, like. I mean, how do you not get that parallel? But it's one of my favorite movies because I love action. And in one of one of the movies, one of these uh, series of the movies, uh, he ends up kind of like at the climactic moment where he finally goes into this bright white room and he's finally out like, man, this is what I'm here for. This is what everybody's been waiting on. This is why I'm the one. And he finds out some news um, that is very disheartening to, you know, he finds out that not only is he supposedly supposed to give his life, but this is actually the sixth iteration of the Matrix, this fake world, this simulation that they've been living in. But, and during that dialogue, he finds out that not only does he have to give himself, but his wife has entered the Matrix to give her life for his life. And then, so in a mad dash, he makes a decision to go save her as quick as he can. He had hope. And that hope gave him a strength to do something that this architect who made the Matrix would have thought was impossible. Interestingly enough, he actually said this thing. He said, the architect, he said, hope is the quintessential human delusion simultaneously the source of your greatest strength and your greatest weakness. Now that sounds fire, but if you step back to look at it, I mean, this is, this is AI, right? This, this is a computer program. He doesn't necessarily understand the complexities of humans. So he calls it a human delusion. So although that's kind of faulty thinking, there is still some truth in it. Because I think you and I both can agree that we've put our, our hope in some things that have caused us weakness. It has been a source of weakness and pain for us. But I want to declare to you today that there's something, in fact, someone we can put our hope in, that when we do, it will be the source of our greatest strength. And with that, let's go into the word today. We're, we're coming from Isaiah chapter 40. Verses 28 through 31. You see it, so see it pop up here on the screen here. But I'm going to read right from here. It says, I'll read it with you. Do you not know that, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hunt in the Lord will renew their strength. Goes on to read, they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. We know this passage of scripture, we most of us have heard this passage of scripture, but I want to take some time to really break down what this scripture means, what it's really talking about, and how we can apply this to our lives today. Because like I said before, if you and I can agree, we put our hope in some things that have been the source of our greatest weakness. But what Isaiah is telling the Israelites here is that if they put their hope and their trust in the Lord, that he will give them a strength that will cause them to do things and be things that seem to be impossible. At least that seem to give them strength to do things that without that strength, they wouldn't be able to do. Now, now, when we look at the context, let's just zoom out a little bit and understand what was going on with the Israelites at this time, right? Isaiah, we find ourselves in chapter 40. That means there's 39 chapters before. And Isaiah in, in the first 39 chapters is basically telling the Israelites that, look, this is punishment. They're exiled. They're cast away from their, their promised land. They're under this rule of this kind of cruel nation. And, and they feel like God has abandoned them. And Isaiah is telling them that 
I know you feel this way, but this is kind of your own fault. Now, I'm not saying that about you, okay? Because we all got perfect Christians a year, right? right? But for his riddle, it was their fault, and it was a just consequence. But in chapter 40, Isaiah brings forth this message of hope that is a transition period for the Israelites saying that, hey, look, this is the Lord our God. And in this, we can find refuge. In this, we can find some application today in our lives going forward to prove this. So the, our first point that we can find within this scripture is that God's strength is resilient. Hmm. Come on, can, can y'all talk back? Somebody say, God's strength is resilient. Here's how we find it. Let's pull up this scripture here. It's verse 28. We're just going to go text, line by line, text by text. It says, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. Is that resilient? Yeah. That's resilient. The creator of the ends of the earth. Now, now watch this. There's this thing called the fine-tuning argument. Anybody ever heard of that? Anybody ever heard of that? Okay, for those who don't know what the fine-tuning argument is, and for us Christians, for us believers, this is an evidence of God for us. The fine-tuning argument essentially states that the universe is so fine-tuned, is so precisely built, that there must be a transcendent, ultimately intelligent being behind the creation of the universe and all that we know. <laughs> Philosophers, scientists, uh, psychologists, physicists all agree that the, the, the parameters set on the earth and the universe are so precise that if they were shifted by even a little bit, life would not be sustainable on here, planet Earth. Now, watch this. Here's some examples for you if you want to kick out with me just for a little bit. Come on. Some of us have heard that the earth spins a thousand miles per hour. Have you all heard that before? Some of us may know this. This might be a little more geeky, okay? But the, the Earth's circumference is like 25,000 miles around, 24,900 miles to be exact. So that's why we spend a thousand miles an hour to get 24 hours in a day. But we know that God said that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He went on to put the lights in the sky, the sun to rule the day, and the stars and the moon to rule the night. And so when this earth is spinning this quickly, with this earth's circumference being what it is, we can now understand how there's proof that, hey, God did create this, and that he did set these parameters. We might look at something like the fact that Psalm 108 and 4 says that the mountains rose, and the valley sank to where he told them to. How we find that? Well, we know that the highest point on the earth is Mount Everest. We all know that. You may not know that the lowest point on the earth is the Mariana Trench. It's like 35,000 feet below sea level. But, it, but scripture shows us that God is doing this. Let's zoom out a little bit more. The sun is 93 million miles away. If we were any closer, we burn. If we were getting further, we freeze, and life wouldn't be sustained. One last thing: if you if you zoom out a little bit more and you start looking at the galaxy, now this is gonna sound like a made-up number. I'm just gonna be honest with you. But they say they estimate that the galaxy measures 587 quadrillion, 900 trillion miles. But here's the funny thing. That's just our galaxy out of what they believe is billions of galaxies. Now, what's the point to all of this? Right? I just geeked out like real tough. That's not. What's the point to all this? The point is this, is that God is not only cosmically powerful, but he's also close in person. Yeah, so that's yeah, so true. This is the God, this God who created all things, this God who, that, that all things are created by, he is not only cosmically powerful, he's not only the one who set the parameters, but he's so close and personal to you that the, the Bible, the book of Luke tells us that he knows the number of the hairs on your head. 
Song says that he has so many thoughts about us that if they were counted, it would number the sands on the seashore. He's not just cosmic and colorful, but he's close and he's personal. And so here's the thing we need to understand. And I said I was going to forget this, but I didn't forget it. Is that this is why we need to trust in the Lord. Let's put up the stretch of Proverbs 3 and 5 through 8. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. And all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Here's what I'm trying to say. Is when we talk about God's strength being resilient, you have to first understand the reason why it's resilient is because of who he is. He gives a strength that lasts and doesn't grow weary and doesn't grow tired because he never does. So if he gives you something that comes from him, how can we, how can we think that that strength will ever run out, that it will ever grow tired, that it will ever get weary? He gives us a strength that's resilient. And the next point that we find is that God's strength is reliable. Yeah, okay. You can take it to the bank. Come on. Yeah. It's a blank check. Oh, you know, you got the um, Christmas prosperity got for right <laughs> there. You know, you went, right? but, but let me bring up, let me bring up this text, right? Verse uh, 29 through 30 is, uh, says, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak, right? Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. Now, here's the piece. Here's the piece. Here's the piece. You would expect that young men, like me, <laughs> wouldn't get so tired. Stamina, right? <laughs> but I'm going to just tell you what. You and I, we get tired. We stumble and we fall. You and I, we're, we're trying to raise our kids, raise our family, go to work and do a great job. Be a good example. Be the light. Not cuss that person out on the freeway. <laughs> but we grow tired. And sometimes in our weariness and our weakness, we stumble and we fall. But he's saying we put our trust in him. That we don't have to worry about that because he gives. He, he gives. He gives strength to the weary. That's right. He gives and he increases the power of the weak. In other words, all you need is what you already have. Yeah. And he'll make up the rest. Okay, man. What's some examples? Yeah. Sure. You might find yourself in a situation like David, right? Everybody heard of David and Goliath? Yeah. Now, he did, some, he did some interesting things, but he was a man of God after God's own heart. And he found himself where everybody thought that he was crazy, where his brothers thought he was just trying to be nosy and peeking in on the war. When he wasn't even an option to be king, God gave him strength to do something that the entire army of Israel was afraid to do. It was to face this giant Philistine, blasting in the name of God. And in a moment where he would have been weak, God gave him strength to use what he already had. Just smooth stone and slingshot what he had already used and he had already said it all throughout his life. I wonder what God is giving you wow. that you already have, wow. which is all that you need, that you've been using all your life. And if he increases the power on that, if he gives you strength when you're weak in those areas, I wonder what giants you can talk about. Thank you, what another example? You might find yourself in a situation where you're weak and weary from betrayal. Like my main man, Samson. <laughs> he trusted in a woman, gave her his deepest secrets. He was so vulnerable with treasure. Even though she kind of made it very clear, red flag alert. <laughs> you ain't to run from this lady. But he was just so weak. For her. He was weak in the knees for her. 
and he gave her his deepest secret. Come to find out she betrayed him and he was captured. But when he had lost the source of his strength, he called out to God and was given a strength where he was weak. His power was increased and he was able to topple the Philistines. One more example. You may be in this room today, like all of us suspect this situation, like the widow with the oil, where she was in financial straits. Can somebody say inflation? <laughs> My God, today. You might be in financial straits. You might be wondering, God, what am I going to do next? How am I going to make the next move? How am I going to send my kid to college? How am I going to pay this bill? Whatever the case may be. And this woman, she took what she had, which was a little bit of oil. And the strength was not the miracle. It wasn't, it wasn't the fact that she was blessed. It was the strength that she had to get up and go collect vessels where she didn't know what was going to happen. She trusted in God and that strength caused her to do something and accomplish something that she would not have been able to do had she not trusted in God and gotten strength to keep pouring and keep pouring and keep pouring and keep pouring and you should keep pouring and keep pouring and keep pouring the oil and keep pouring into your children and keep pouring into your workplace and keep pouring into your ministry. You should keep pouring. And what maybe what you'll find out is that you don't run out until you run out of vessels. Come on. So not only is God's strength resilient, but it's reliable. Mm -hmm. The third point we find is that God's strength is revealing. It's revealing. It's revealing. What is it revealing? Let's, let's pull up the text again. This is pretty much the last one. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Yeah, right? They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I just want to go back. Actually, I want to go back to that first one that we just looked at, where it talks about those who hope in the Lord. I'm gonna brace it down for you guys. The word, the word hope in this text is a Hebrew word, kava. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta just say close fly long, right? Can, can anybody say that with me? What? Now the first part of this word, kav, is the picture of a rope, okay? So if I take a rope, I didn't bring lift with me, okay? I'm not that sweet with it. If I, if I had a rope, well, you can imagine, if I pull this rope and pull this rope and pull, put a whole lot of tension on this rope, what is bound to happen at some point? What is it? It's going to break, right? It's going to snap. Hope kava is, is a picture of an anticipation of something happening that's bound to happen. It's inevitable. There's no way it's not going to happen. So when we talk about hope, we're talking about putting our trust and our hope, our anticipation that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. What he promised is going to come to pass. Well, how do we know it's God we're talking about? He says we put our hope in the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. In this text, when you look at it in your Bibles, there's three ways that the Lord is represented in the Bible. One is all lowercase, and that's just us regular evilness. There's one where the L is uppercase, and that's what we're talking about, master. But the one that's actually represented in this particular text is all capital letters, but little letters. <laughs> Lord meaning Jehovah or Yahweh. This thing self-existent is transcendent. It means he's eternal. It, it means I am that I am. I am, I be, I be, I be. Meaning I'm eternal. I can be what I need to be. He says that I cause to come to pass. That's what that word Lord means. So in the, in the Elisha Poole expanded version of the I would say that this text right here means that when we trust in the one who can cause all things to be with no permission and with no limitation, that with anticipation that it's bound to happen, he will do our thing. 
This is, this is something that's internal. And when he renews that strength, which is to give you a new strength, a strength you don't already have, one that's sufficient, that, that over exceeds what you already have, then we go to that next text, and it says that you will soar on wings like eagles. You'll be able to fly through storm clouds with strength and agility to get to the top of the cloud and glide and soar on those waves. Another thing that the eagle is able to do, though, is it's able to sense when a storm is coming, sometimes hours before the storm comes. So him giving you this kind of strength with anticipation that is bound to happen, that he can cause what he said would be to be. Won't you trust him and go move and do what he's asking us to do? with the strength that he's given us before we even have to face a storm, you'll soar on wings like eagles. You'll also be able to run and not be weary. Now that seems pretty impossible. I'm just going, if I, if I ran, if I tried to run to the back of this parking lot, you would probably have to call an ambulance. <laughs> like, because I would pass out. I would definitely be weary. But just imagine what that life would look like. If when you're at your wit's end, when you're at the end of your stamina, when you're at the end of your road, you get that second wind. And when the second wind is over, you get a third wind. And when the third wind is over, you get a fourth wind. And wind and wind and wind. Just imagine what that life would look like. That where you're weak, God gives you a strength that keeps you pushing on beyond human limitations. And then you'd be able to walk and not faint. You're walking this life out. You're walking this Christian life out. You're, some of us in this room may not be believers in Jesus Christ. I was taught never to assume because I don't know where you are. But guess what? You may be walking this life out on your own. But just imagine if everything that caused you to faint up until this point, imagine if you made a decision to trust in the Lord and he would help you walk this thing called life out without even fainting, without passing out, without getting too tired, without being too weak, without being too weary. Imagine what that life would look like. So as we kind of wrap this up, I want to show you that this hope that Isaiah is talking about, it, it, it reveals that this strength comes from Jesus. It, it is simply this, that this strength we find is revealed in Jesus. But wait, preacher, Isaiah didn't say Jesus right here. Isaiah didn't say Jesus. Jesus hadn't been born yet. Well, let me teach you something before we go to the next scripture and wrap this up. Let me just teach you something real quick. In the beginning of this particular chapter, chapter 40, verse number three, he says, to be a voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord in the desert. Hey, we, you never heard that before? Anybody heard that before? John the Baptist, right? So Isaiah prophesied this over 700 years before John the Baptist lived. And we find in John chapter 1, verse 23, that this is where John says these words. The, the, the religious leaders of the day came and asked him, who are you? Are you Elijah? Can come back. Are, 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 are you a prophet? He says, no. He said, then who are you? He said, I'm a voice crying out in the wilderness. Make way. Make straight paths for the Lord. And he said, in the, if you look at that scripture, it says, in the words of Isaiah the prophet, who again was 700 years before. And then the next day, Jesus steps on the scene and he says, this is the one, this is the man I was talking about. The Lamb of God. And what's interesting is that some of us in this room today have been putting our hope in everything but the Lamb of God. We've been putting our hope in everything but the one who can cause to me 
the one who is transcendent above it all, the one whose name is above every name. You can put how old and so many other things, but I declare to you today that this is why you should put your hope in him. It's because of what Paul teaches us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 through 10. He says it like this when Paul was praying, Lord, take this stone away from me. He prayed three times. And some of us are in this room like, God, please take this thing away from me. This thing that's making me so weak. This thing that's making me so weary. This thing that's making me so fatigued and stumbled and fall. Take it away from me. And he says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I be strong. I would urge you, I would plead with you that where you are weak, be made strong by putting your hope in the one who is transcendent above it all. Yeah. The one who can cause whatever he says to be, to be. That's right. The Lord. The right. Father, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Your grace that's sufficient. We thank you for making us strong where we're weak for making us like the eagle who can soar through the storm clouds and even has awareness to rise above it all before the storm comes. We thank you, Lord, that you can give us the stamina, the energy, the strength to run and never have to stop because we don't grow weary with your strength. We thank you, Lord, for helping us walk out this life and not have to faint. We thank you that when we put our hope in you, understanding it is an anticipation that something's bound to happen because it's you that said it. We thank you, Lord, that we can trust in that and know that it is so, and we can live our lives accordingly. I pray for the one here who does not trust you, God. They put their hope and things that have become the source of their greatest weakness. I praise Father God that you will show them who you are so that when they realize who you are, they can trust that you have not only the ability, but the willingness to give them strength. And I pray for the one Lord who has been holding on to you, who's been, who, who's been taking advantage of the strength that you give, but they are indeed yet the still more weary. I pray, Father God, that you would ignite their strength. Whether they're weak, you would give them more strength, Lord. You would give them grace that's sufficient. Even if you don't take it away, Father God, you would show them that in their weakness, your strength is made perfect. And that it reveals that you are the source in their lives. Lord, we just thank you so much for everything that you taught us all to worship this word. And we ask, Lord, that we will be so careful to go forward and apply it to our lives so that we can be the example of what strength really looks like. Amen. Amen.